I'm the one that Jesus loves is what we talked about last week. And we covered the first five verses of Second John. Now, I combined Second and Third John for this particular study. Both of them only have one chapter. First John has 13 verses. Second John only has 14. 27 verses in two books of the Bible total. Uh, so instead of treating them separately, I bunched them together. So this is called the Second and Third John study. Uh, of course, it, First John has five chapters. It's very good. I wrote a commentary on that book, an amazing book. But I had never ventured into teaching verse by verse these two short epistles. So uh, we started last week, covered the first five verses of 13. And here's how John started the letter, the elder referring to himself the elder unto the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth and not I only but also all they that have known the truth so we shared with you last week commentaries aren't quite sure what to make of who this elect lady is some commentaries by the way the word uh, the New Testament is written in Greek and the Greek word rendered lady is K-U-R-I-A, Korea. Korea. And some people think that what John was saying is not to the elect lady, but to the chosen Korea. That it should have been rendered as a name um, in this case. Because talking about a lady and her children. And uh, so some think that. Of all the commentaries I looked at to look at that verse and figure out what I think it means, the only ones who had any certainty was there was a couple of those commentaries who believed it was a woman named Korea. All the other commentaries shared the multiplicity of possibilities and all concluded there's no way to know for sure. So, when I finished this book, uh, in verse... 13, the last verse, he talks about your elect sister greets you. So you got a, uh, an elect lady in verse 1 and an elect sister in verse the, the 13, the final verse. So because of that, I picked a side. I can't say with any confidence, but I can tell you what I and I will that last Sunday I'm in this the next Sunday or the one after that I will tell you the other pos uh, what I believe uh, the elect lady and the elect sister to mean uh, but in the meantime here's some of the possibilities the commentators come up with it meant a, a predominant woman someone maybe perhaps wealthy and her children so perhaps a widow. Uh, and the children is used with a negative, I mean a masculine noun. So we would suppose if this is an individual, she had, uh, her children were all boys. And um, wouldn't that be awful, Angie? Just have boys. Uh, but anyway, that's one possibility. Some say they believe John was 95 when he wrote this somewhere around there, 95 years old. That's a long time to live in those days, especially in persecution. Tradition tells us they tried to boil him in oil one time and God wasn't through with him yet, so he didn't die. So they banished him to the Isle of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. Well, Chuck Swindoll, one of my favorite radio preachers, believes he wrote all of his books on that island. The Gospel of John, First John, Second John, Third John, and Revelation. And uh, um, I have no way to know. I mean, we know he wrote Revelation because that's how the book starts. He's identifying where he's at when he writes a book. But um, some believe that uh, he wrote all those uh, there. So, And some very uh, wise teachers of Scripture. So that's a possibility. He was around 95 when he wrote this. And he would have been by far, for many years now, perhaps 30 years, the only living disciple of Jesus Christ of the 12. The only living. And then 
Paul was one born out of due season. He was long gone by this time as well. Uh, so John was kind of the senior citizen of the church worldwide. And he seen uh, in his 95th year around there somewhere, he seen all kinds of doctrinal error coming into the church. And he wanted to correct it. And he really hits it head on in First John. And he alludes to a few things in Second John uh, as well. So, we covered, uh, it's, again, now, it, the main three pro- possibilities of who this woman is, she's a woman with children. Or she's a local church, and the children are the parishioners. Or she is the church worldwide, and all believers are her children. Those are the possibilities that the commentators throw around out there. And I'm talking about people who are so smart, they have written commentary in every single verse in the Bible. That's pretty smart. And uh, they know the way around the Scripture. So, um, those are the three main possibilities of who who this woman is. And uh, I, I won't go into who I think it is today, but when I hit verse 13, I will. And again, I'll use the word, I think, because I can't be proven. That, and I want you to know that even at my ripe old age, I still think. So maybe I could run for president. But anyway, just a thought. So in verse um, 2, he said, for the truth's sake. He said, all those other people uh, that know the truth of the gospel as well, They love you, and because this truth dwells in them forever and ever. And then he gave the kind of greeting that Paul always gets to after he gives the little introduction in every one of his epistles. He'll get to something like John said here, grace to you and peace from God or some such. John writes, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. And then in verse 4, he said, I rejoice greatly that I found thy children walking in truth, as we have received commandment from the the Father. So he's saying to this elect lady, I'm very happy to discover that your your children um, are walking in truth. So he was excited about that. So obviously that means either this specific woman he wrote to, her boy children were all living for God, and John rejoiced, or the local church that he was writing to, all of its parishioners were living for God, or the church worldwide, and all the Christians were living for God. So, it means one of those three things, I, I think it's abundantly clear, but which? We don't know. But verse 5 last week was, And now I beseech you, lady, not as though I write, wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. So, now he goes into much like he did in First John. In chapter 2, he tells him, I'm not writing a new commandment unto you, but I'm writing an old one. But then later on he calls that old commandment new. So you might say, why doesn't he make up his mind? Is it old or is it new? And the answer is yes. To both. And uh, so what in the world could he be talking about? Well, we went through that in First John. Of course, it's been a long time for you guys since I've been in First John. But we were through that in First John. The old Commandment. Now, some commentators believe it to refer to the second greatest commandment of the Old Testament. Remember when someone asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Wanting to argue with him, thinking he'd name one of the Ten Commandments. But he didn't. He said, the greatest uh, commandment is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love one another as thyself. So a lot of people think that John is calling it an Old Commandment because it's been around since the Old Testament. Uh, I don't believe that myself. And uh, I believe the Old Commandment he's talking about is the one Jesus gave his disciples on the night he was betrayed in the upper room. He said, A new commandment, he even called it that, Give I unto you that you'll love one another as I have loved you. 
that new commandment was now 30 or, or 60 some years old by the time John wrote this letter and by the time he wrote First John. So he's saying, I'm not writing something new to you. I'm writing something that's been around ever since you've been a Christian. It's old. It's always been the main truth of the New Testament church. We're to love one another. And, um, but, he said in a sense it's, uh, it, it's an old one, but in a sense it's new. In what sense? The second greatest commandment of the Old Testament, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, was a, an old one, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the New Testament, and uh, it's brand new in the sense this one represents the new covenant. The second greatest commandment represented the old covenant. So it's an old law as far as the last decade of the first century A.D. is concerned. It's an old commandment because it had been around most of the lives of everybody who's going to read that letter. They have to be over 65 or somewhere around there for them to have lived before this letter, uh, before Jesus gave that commandment in the upper room. And so there were certainly some that uh, that had heard it. But to everyone else, they had heard it the moment they got saved. Whatever church, Christian church they went to, they started preaching what Jesus taught them in the upper room. So it was an old commandment, and yet it was brand new in the sense it was for a new covenant, not the old. All right, so, now let's go on to this week. Again, I didn't get, I had cut it and pasted, you know, I'm the one that Jesus loved and somehow cut off part of it, but I didn't worry about it because I was going to change the name anyway and then forgot about it because uh, uh, I was scared to death of being late to my daughter's house. I, I I could tell you horror stories about what she does to me when I mess up. I just um, see what happens when your mom's back there. I got got to pick on someone else. But anyway, uh, so a name. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about the commandments that we Christians are to keep, and uh, it's an interesting thing. But basically, there's two things. We should have faith in God and we should love all other Christians. Now, why does the New Testament stress that I should love all other Christians instead of telling me to love everybody? There are areas of Scripture that teach you how to love all all people. But the command is not worded that way because Jesus said in the upper room, if you'll love each other the way I love you, all these people you've got to preach to will know you're the real deal. And it's a lot easier to make ground when people know you're the real deal. They might not agree with you, but they'll know you're not phonies. So the only evidence that Jesus gave in the in, in his teaching that he tells us will end the argument whether or not we're sincere is if we love each other the way he loves us. Doesn't matter if we quit smoking, doesn't matter if we quit drinking, doesn't matter if we uh, quit doing this, quit doing the other thing. Uh, lots of people can give up a lot of bad habits. It doesn't mean they're God's children. But if you can love God's children, I tell you what, we make it hard on each other sometimes. But if you can love all of God's children, that's an evidence to even your biggest skeptic. I don't agree with that guy, that gal, but man, they're the real deal. They believe what they're telling me. And Jesus gave them that as the only evidence. So keep that rule. And so we're going to look into what he says in verses 6 and 7. In verse 6, And this is love, that we walk after His commandments. This is the commandment that, as you've heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. I put down a similar passage from 1 John. The one I read to you was from 2 John. Remember, epistles are simply letters written. So the first letter John wrote uh, was 1 John. The second letter, obviously, 2 John. And that, that is part of Scripture. I'm sure he wrote other letters, but we're talking about Scripture now. And uh, so... In his first letter, 1 John three twenty two to 4 listen to how he words something very similar. 
You're going to love verse 22. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him. How come? Because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. All right? Which commandments? The ten? Look at verse 23. And this is His commandment. You notice in verse 6 of Second John, He does the same thing. And the, and the commentators will tell you, this isn't a mistranslation. He starts with the pearl and ends with the singular. We need to keep His commandments. And this is His commandment. In both verse 6 of Second John and, and in uh, third chapter of 1 John, He does the same thing. You've got to keep His commandments. And uh, here's what His commandment is. In Second John, or First John, believe on the name of His Son Jesus Christ and love one another as He gave His commandment. That is the commandment of God, and made up in commandment. So why John utilizes that, I'm not sure, but he did it twice uh, at least. I haven't been into Third John yet. Maybe I'll find it there again. And he that keepeth His commandments dwells in Him, and He in Him, and hereby we know that He abides in us by the Spirit which He has given us. So, if I love you the way Jesus loves me, the world out there will know I'm a gen- the genuine article. They might not believe my message, but they'll know that I'm not a phony. But now he adds something else here. He said, if I do these two things, if I have my faith firmly planted in God, and I love His people, it said... I dwell in God, God dwells in me, and hereby we know that He abides in us. So, this is the scripture to stand on in 1 John there. If you struggle with, Lord, am I a Christian or aren't I? John is saying, if you get these two things right, you can rest assured you're a a Christian. You can rest assured that God is living in you. Put your faith in God and don't let it be moved anywhere else. And love God's people. You get those two things right, and you don't have to wonder whether or not you're a Christian. All right, flip that page over. He says in verse seven, "For many deceivers entered into the are entered into the world." So in in verse uh, again, verse six, he's saying this is love that we keep his commandments, and we got to do that. And now over here in verse seven, he says, and here's why we got to get this faith in God, loving His people, right? Because there are a whole bunch of lying outfits calling themselves men or women of God, running around with lies that aren't based on the Word of God. And he said, many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. The believer's Bible commentary writes on this verse, The Gnostics believe that the divine Christ came upon Jesus of Nazareth for a short period of time, but John insists that Jesus Christ was, is, and always will be God. In other words, uh, again, the Gnostics, are those who teach license. The Judaizers taught legalism. Do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Uh, The Gnostics, really strong by the end of the first century, they were the ones who taught that they had a special revelation from God and they had enlightenment that the others didn't have. And they taught that God only saved uh, your spirit he didn't save your body. Well, that part's true. Romans eight tells, or uh, Romans seven tells me my body is not saved. Uh, Romans eight tells me that I groan for the day I'll have a saved body. The only reason we can ever be tempted to sin as Christians is because we live in an unredeemed body that has sin dwelling in its members, according to Romans seven. When we go to heaven, we're going to go in a new body. If we're dead when the trump of God sounds, wherever they scattered our ashes or buried our body, whether it's in the ocean, whether it's in the desert somewhere, whether it's on a battlefield overseas somewhere, wherever it is, God knows. If you were cremated, God knows where every part of those 
cremated uh, ashes went. And in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, Jesus will shout a command and your old body will form itself together and in one moment not be the body you died in, but be a redeemed body. Be a glorious body fitted for heaven and that body never get old, never get sick and will have absolutely zero sin dwelling in its members. Which means when you get to heaven there will never be such a thing as temptation. That will not exist in heaven. In hell, it will be abundant and you will have no way to satisfy the temptation. Constantly tempted and no way to really fulfill it. All right, so he said that there's a whole bunch of false teachers coming. And uh, again, I go over this, I hope you don't find it too boring, and go over it every time. I want you to know what a Gnostic is. A Judaizer is a not a word you're going to find in the Bible, nor are you going to find Gnostic. A Judaizer is usually a Jew who claims to have gotten saved, but then goes around to the churches Paul and others started when they leave, and said, yeah, they're, they're, they told you the truth, you're saved by faith. But now if you want to stay saved, you got to keep Moses' law. And so they set out to get all these young churches to marry Moses to Jesus. That's what the Judaizers did. Paul did not like Judaizers. He said, if anyone preaches another gospel than the one I preach, let him be cursed he knew there's only one message that can get someone to heaven and he did not want that message altered so that was the Judaizer the Gnostic is someone who uh, again we're familiar today with agnostic that's the word Gnostic with the letter A in front of it when you put the letter A in front of a word it's a negative it means it's, it's not the word Gnostic uh, means like these people in the first century the word Gnostic means they think they know everything. The word Gnostic means to know. In today's language, agnostic puts a negative in front of to know and means not to know. And so an agnostic is someone who doesn't believe in God, but he won't completely rule him out. I don't know. There could be a God. I don't think so. That's an agnostic. An atheist is swear up and down don't you ever call me an agnostic I know there's no God so I guess he's been everywhere in the universe and every place else and he can categorically decide there is no God and that's my brother Jerry but nonetheless um, the Gnostic taught because your body isn't saved God doesn't care what your body does go ahead and sin a little and your redeemed spirit will learn lessons from that so Gnostics didn't teach legalism. You got to do it all right. Do it all right. Do it all right. They taught it doesn't matter, man. Have fun. You're going to have an eat away. Have a ball. Gnostics weren't waiting. You know uh, how many ever heard an atheist say, oh, "I want to go to hell. That's where all my buddies are going to be, and we'll down a beer and have a party." Well, I'm going to tell you something. There won't be any parties down there, but. Uh, they want a party. Well, that's basically what the Gnostics thought you can have here on the planet. You can have a party, and God doesn't care. And so what do you get in a lot of churches in America today? You get them teaching, not only is God okay with what you're doing, He made you that way to do it. That's the modern-day American, modern day American version of Gnosticism. And uh, John said there's a lot of false teachers coming and you've got to keep your eyes out for them. And one way, he said, you can identify them is if they refuse to confess that Jesus Christ literally came to this planet as God and as man, clothed in flesh. If they try to explain that way away, like the Jehovah Witnesses, for example, 
in any way, shape, or form, um, they're a false teacher. The one thing we got to get right, there's a lot of people whose doctrine I consider very bad. I won't call them... Uh, oh, I used to have this word for... Uh, uh, her- uh, I won't call them a heretic. That's not the word I'm thinking of, but I, I'll grab that one. I won't call them heretics as long as they get the Godhead right. Everything else might be messed up some. But they need to have the doctrine of God correct. And if they don't, Jesus was not Michael the archangel who came down and was born of Mary, uh, called Jesus, died on the cross, to redeem man, went back to heaven, became Michael again. That's what the Jehovah Witnesses teach. That Jesus was, is, and always will be God. And anything else is there. Alright, so, I'm going to read you a verse at the bottom of the page there. We all love John 3.16. Here's 1 Timothy 3.16. Here's what we got to get right. This is something Paul wrote to Timothy. Without controversy, he said there's no mistake about this. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached on to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So, what is Paul saying is, I got some bo- a bullet list of those 16 things, I mean of those six things at the bottom of the page. This is something we got to have right. we got to understand God was manifest in the flesh. That means Jesus is God. God was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the Spirit. Some commentators believe what's meant there is three or four times a voice from heaven spoke about Jesus when He was baptized. This is my beloved Son. Um and there was one other time he said words similar to that but added the phrase in whom I am well pleased so that's what some believe uh, that to mean that the Holy Spirit was uh, testifying of the the uh, divinity of Christ he was justified in the spirit he was seen by angels Um, and there are some scriptural verses David Guzik uh, mentioned some of the times uh, gives it verses you can look up there a couple of them where uh, the scripture has angels uh, seeing Jesus and especially at the resurrection um, then he was preached on to the Gentiles through Paul's ministry we all know that all you, you got to do is read all of his Paul's epistles he was believed on in the world as proved by the myriad of followers of Christ that have walked this earth Multiple, multiple, millions and millions and millions over the centuries, perhaps a billion or two, have put their faith in Christ. And then, as Luke 24 tells us, he was received up in glory. Why does Paul give Timothy this list? Probably for the same reason John tells us what he tells us. He wants us to be able to identify error. Them are basic things about God basic truths about God they are not debatable they are necessary for true doctrine